Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from our gospel lesson. I read again John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. What a lovely sentiment we find in the words of Jesus today. He is the good shepherd, and his sheep hear his voice and follow him. And we, of course, have a great illustration of that in our intro at Psalm today, Psalm 23. Because the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, they follow him. Therefore, they get to lie down in green pastures. They get to drink from still waters. Their souls are restored and so forth. Just so that you know, because you might not know this about sheep and shepherding and all that kind of stuff, still waters were safe waters. Rushing streams were unsafe for the sheep. And that is because as they would drink the water, their wool would get all wet, get all soaked up with water, and then the stream would just carry them away to a watery death. That's why still waters are so important for sheep. <clears throat> At any rate, the psalm depicts a caring shepherd who sees to it that his sheep have safe food to eat, good food to eat, and safe water to drink. He also defends him from the sheep from other dangers like wolves and whatnot, and that's what all that rod and staff imaging is about. But there is a danger in such beautiful pictorial images and language. The picture can be twisted to suit just about anything. So I'm going to lead you to safe pastures. Follow me. Worship me. Pay me. Buy me a Cadillac. And you will have wonderful things in your life. Well, what's my proof? I'm leading you to safe pastures, see? So you have to be careful when you get a beautiful picture to understand it. The image is twistable. In our reading from Acts, Paul warns the pastors, because he's talking to pastors there, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. These false teachers twist the sweet gospel until what the flock is feeding on is poisonous grass and drinking from dangerous streams. The false teachers of whom Paul is warning are not only found outside the flock, these wolves, but also spring up in the flock, in the church seeking to destroy the flock from within. The false teachers, whether they are wolves or false shepherds, say they are speaking the truth, but instead they are speaking deadly lies. The question for us sheep is, how can we tell the voice of the good shepherd from the voice of the false shepherds and fierce wolves? This is actually a major theme in the Bible, though Scripture speaks of it in a variety of different ways. Uh, one, for example, uh, Jesus speaks, uh, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. Knowing the difference between the good shepherd's voice and the voice of the false shepherds and wolves is the same thing as knowing which way leads to life and which way leads to death. Trust me on this one. <clears throat> the way to destruction is not advertised as such. You will not find any doors that say the gates of hell. You will find lots of doors that say the way of heaven. All false shepherds promise eternal bliss. The wolves also often promise this. But all of them, a false shepherd or a wolf, will promise a rich and abundant life. 
Nobody says misery and hell ahead. You don't get a large following that way. In the same vein, Jesus also once said, Everyone who hears these words of mine, words of mine, words of mine, and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Once again, we are left with the same question. Which words are the words of Christ, the solid rock on which we are to build so we will have, be able to survive the storms of life and enter heaven? And which words are the shifting sand on which if we build our lives, our, our homes will be destroyed by the storms of life? Once again, there are no signs warning that the plots of sand are unsuitable for trying to build eternal abodes. In fact, the exact opposite is true. The shifting sand is advertised as solid, suitable for building eternal abodes. You might think, well, we'll just listen for a few quotes from the Bible in the message to know if that is good, solid ground. But that is not good enough. Let us remember that the people who condemned Jesus to death knew and quoted the scriptures. Shoot, even the devil knows and quotes scriptures. You remember the story about how the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, the beginning of his ministry? And the devil was quoting the Bible to tempt Jesus. In fact, this is such a pattern for the devil to twist scriptures that we are told that he disguises himself as an angel of light. Our guide to what is the true voice of the good shepherd, though, must be the scriptures. But not just a little snippet here and a snippet there, which is the practice of all false teachers, to take a piece of the Bible out of context. St. Paul said in our reading from Acts that he proclaimed the whole counsel of God. Sadly, though, that very phrase, the whole counsel of God, can also be twisted. If I just pull that out, like I say, we don't just take a snippet. If I just pull that one out, then I can run on forever about who knows what. My soul has told me. Oh, I got a good one. I did this once. You know? How many people would like to have more money? Anybody? Okay. So you take out your ear. I had this planned at this other church, and I had a scarf and kitty. My wallet, right? I've been promised by the Holy Spirit that I'm going to pray money into my wallet. And if each of you gives me $10, I'll pray money into your purse or wallet also. That's the whole counsel of God. Is it? You look at the entire scriptures to find out if that's what you know it is. <laughs> or if it is the Word of God. And we have no promise of that in the Bible, do we? We look to the context to find out the truth. What does Paul tell us that the whole counsel of God is? We see it in our reading out of Acts. I, Paul, did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to Jews and Greeks. Now he's going to tell you what that profitable stuff was, what that whole counsel of, of God was. Repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. 
right there in the big context. And again, that I, Paul, may finish my course in ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. What is that course in ministry that gives you that whole counsel of God? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And again, I have got him around proclaiming the kingdom, which is not built on you giving me $10 out of your purse so that you can become multimillionaires. And again, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish everyone with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. For Paul, the whole counsel of God is all tied up in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That is how we identify the voice of the Good Shepherd. In Lutheran circles, we call this the doctrine of justification. When other doctrines of the Bible are taught, and there are other doctrines in the Bible, you know, like the Trinity or, or baptism, whatever, but when other doctrines of the Bible are taught, they are taught in light of this central truth. So, for example, when we consider God the Father, we recognize that He is our Father only because Jesus is our brother. If Jesus is not our brother, that is, if we have not repented and come to faith in Jesus Christ, received the justification He has merited for us, then God is not our loving Father. The fatherhood of God is not dependent on, our on God as our creator, but on Christ as our redeemer. So Jesus once taught, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. If we are speaking of the Holy Spirit, we remember that we are speaking of the Spirit of Christ. If we are speaking of sanctification, we recognize that it is into the image of Christ that we are being shaped. Indeed, Jesus once said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. That's his job. When we speak of creation, we recognize that it is not an examination of the naked power of God, but a revelation of Jesus, who is the word by whom all things were created. I could go on and list how each doctrine in a standard dogmatics can be focused through the lens of justification, but I'm assuming everybody here has gotten that idea by now. If you are listening for the voice of the Good Shepherd, and I know all of us here are, then you are listening for a word about Jesus. This word is about repentance and faith in Christ, not something I make up. Just because I stand here and I say, Jesus, you know, be good so that Jesus will love you. Jesus is not like Santa Claus, who's watching you to find out who's naughty or nice. Jesus is love. And so he loves us, even when we're naughty. And he's ready to forgive us. He loves us into being nice. This word that we're listening for then again is repentance and faith in Christ. So, for example, when we talk about the Incarnation, we're talking about Christmas and that sort of stuff, right? We join in the Nicene Creed and recognize that He became incarnate for us men and for our salvation. The story has not had its proper effect if we sit back and admire the power of God or the love of God or the creativity of God in some sort of abstract way. The story has its proper impact 
when it brings us to trust in Jesus as our Savior. When it turns us away from the weak and beggarly offerings of the world, our sinful flesh, and even the devil, and turns us to the incarnate Son. When someone speaks for the Lord, they are speaking of the Lord who came for our salvation, and they are bringing us that message. False shepherds may well speak of Jesus, but they will teach a Jesus who expects us to somehow achieve his love, not a Jesus who loves us and shapes us. The real Jesus does not let us slip through his hands. So Jesus said in our gospel lesson, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. <coughs> Jesus guards us when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He does not abandon us. Because of Jesus, we fear no evil. He protects us. False shepherds lead us away from the loving, all-powerful, and gracious Jesus and into a wilderness of doubt and despair or a wilderness of self-confidence in our own achievements. How many movies or other things have you seen that urge you to believe in yourself? You can't save yourself. You can't justify yourself. How many movies have you seen about redeeming yourself? You can't do it! Jesus is the redeemer. Jesus is the justifier. Jesus is the lover of your soul. Trust in Christ. The voice of the good shepherd calls to his sheep, calls them to him. The voices of the false shepherds and the wolves direct us away from Jesus. The sheep recognize that grace and truth come from Jesus and no one else. So, for example, when we read that the Holy Spirit is truth, we recognize that it is not some abstract truth, that is found, but the truth that is found in Jesus alone. When we read Jesus saying, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, we recognize that he is not talking about some philosophical truth, but about the truth that is found in Jesus. In fact, you could just as easily read that saying, you will know Jesus and Jesus will set you free. Now, so far I've actually mainly concentrated on straight doctrinal points without giving many examples of how these truths are applied as we read the scriptures and live our lives. And I have only time for one example, so I'm going to select a passage which is well known. It's right out of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Anybody never heard that passage before? Okay. This passage does not mean that if you are a good negotiator, you have merited life and adoption into the family of God. This passage does not mean that if you are the peacemaker in your family, you have achieved salvation through that ability. We must understand this first as pointing to Jesus. He is the original peacemaker. He makes peace between us and the Father. He is the eternal Son of God. By grace, through faith in Him, we become sons of God. He makes peace between us and the Father. The great peacemaker is now a part of who we are, and into his image the Holy Spirit is shaping us. As we are baptized into Christ, the divine peacemaker, we are shaped into peacemakers. Therefore, due to the actions of the Spirit, working through the word of the gospel, we become peacemakers. Others can recognize this and will call us sons of God, especially the Father who will recognize the image of his eternal Son in us and therefore identify us as sons of God. So this passage first points us to Jesus, teaching repentance and faith. It does not teach good works as a way to achieve adoption into the family of God. 
It also teaches the continued good work of the Spirit in our lives as He conforms us into the image of Jesus, the image of a Son of God. There are all sorts of wolves and false shepherds and false voices in our world. We listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd. When we do, we hear of the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. From this shepherd, this good shepherd, we will never be separated. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.